Every cult starts with a story. The apocalypse is upon us. UFOs will take us to the next level. I am the second coming of Christ. It was this last one that hooked Diane Ben Scoder. It was 1974, the height of the Vietnam War. Diane was 17. She just left home a few days earlier. She wanted to stop the war. I was very idealistic and very young. Yeah. I was, you know, barely 17. I had quit school and um, my parents kind of gave me an ultimatum of either going to college or getting a job. And they were so frustrated because all the teachers said I had so much potential, but I just wanted to do something about the war. I was very, very upset about the war and I was very influenced by the music of the era. I would listen hours endlessly to all the music about the war mostly. She loved Cat Stevens, Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young. Stuff like that. I knew there were people out there trying to create a different world where this wasn't going on. And so I wanted to be part of it. And hey, thanks very much for coming, right? Diane went to live with her older brother in Lincoln, Nebraska. She decided to try and become a journalist. Because I thought that would be a way to make a difference in the world. And so I went into this place where there was this local newspaper, kind of a progressive little newspaper. And the guy told me to go get a story and bring it back, that they didn't hire people to go get stories, that you bring a story and we'll see, you know. And so as I was leaving there, this van pulled up and these people jumped out with these boxes of bananas with flyers wrapped around them that said, walk for world peace to hear Sun Myung Moon speak. And I had no idea who Sun Myung Moon was, but walk for world peace sounded perfect. And I thought I would write a story about it. If you grew up in the 70s and 80s, you probably know what a Mooney is. But for you youngins out there, Amuni was a member of a Korean organization called the Unification Church. It was led by the Reverend Sun Young Moon. He claimed to be the second coming of Jesus. People were crazy for him. At his peak, he had almost 50,000 followers. And when he died in 2012, they displayed his body in a glass casket on top of a mound of flowers, like Snow White. When I was a kid, the Moonies were famous for their mass weddings. They'd get married in these huge ceremonies, like 2,000 couples at Madison Square Garden. Almost all the matches were arranged by the Reverend Moon himself. The brides and the grooms will now exchange wedding rings. I remember seeing a picture of one of these weddings in the newspaper. This whole sea of white dresses, all the grooms in red ties. I remember my mom shaking her head, saying, those poor kids. But I was fascinated. Who was this guy, Moon, with his thousand smiling brides? Anyway, back in 1974, when the Moonies told Diane about their five-day walk for world peace, it seemed like a miracle to her. Like God had heard her wish to stop the war, and now he was showing her how to do it. And so I decided to go on this walk. It was a five-day walk from Omaha to Des Moines to hear Moon speak. There were 10 Moonies on the walk, plus five young recruits like Diane. And we started out on this walk, 150 miles. And while we were walking, there'd be two people assigned to each of us to talk to us and tell us how special we were and how God had led us there and how one day there'd be an ideal world and that's what God had planned. And I bought into it. At first, I thought these people were kind of strange. They dressed funny and stuff. And <laughs> Well, the Moonies Christian, I, I'm, I'm not... The doctrine claimed, what they, they professed was that Jesus had essentially failed his mission. He was supposed to get married, and he was supposed to populate the world with sinless children. It was supposed to make up for the fall of man. And because his followers were not faithful enough, he was murdered, and then God had to wait 2,000 more years to send his son again. Now God's son was back in the form of Reverend Sun Young Moon. And it culminates with learning that according to all of this, the Messiah should be on the earth and he should have come from a country from the east and he's bringing a new message. And by the way, this all comes from Sun Myung Moon, who we're on the way to see, who's from Korea. And all five of us had this amazing understanding that, oh my God, the Messiah is here and we are going to meet him. By the time they got to the house where Moon was staying, Diane was vibrating with excitement. She says it was like coming face-to-face -face with God himself. 
there was this feeling of this is we're like at, at the feet of Jesus, only better. It was contagious, that feeling that the other members had because they knew how special it was. And this was all new to me. But if they handed you tea, it was like sacred tea. Anything that came from him was sacred. And I realized that, you know, God had chosen me to be a disciple. Diane gave up on being a journalist. She started fasting at the Mooney's recommendation. She cut off all her hair, gave it to the Reverend Moon as a present. Someone told me, well, what are you proud of that you could give up? And, you know, in that era, long hair, and I had really long hair and I was very proud of it. So I cut it off and (laughs) just with scissors, just straight across. All in all, Diane lived with the Moonies for five years, basically devoting her every breath to serving Reverend Moon before she finally realized she was in a cult. By that point, she was broke and exhausted, on the verge of a nervous breakdown. She'd been living out of a van with a bunch of other Moonies, selling candy and flowers seven days a week to raise money for the church. They often worked 18-hour days, never took weekends. Diane had cut off communication with her parents and all her old friends. She thought they were all possessed by the devil. I was warned that often Satan works through the ones you love. And that because I have made it this far on the path to serve the Messiah, that Satan and his army of villains basically would be working really hard to get me out. Eventually, Diane's parents staged an intervention. They hired a deprogrammer, a former Mooney. She came to talk to Diane one day while Diane was visiting her brother. I decided to talk to her because I thought, I could, not only will I go back, but I'll bring someone back into the fold. I bet I can bring her back in. And so then she started making sense. And my world crumbled. It, I, it was devastating. It was the most devastating moment of my life to realize that the whole thing was a lie. Diane ended up becoming a culty programmer herself. She runs a nonprofit called Antidote in Portland, Oregon. It's devoted to helping people get out of cults. Most of the work she does these days involves QAnon. So those two gentlemen are promoters of the QAnon conspiracy theory. QAnon picking up some new momentum. Let me ask you about QAnon. And today, that subject is QAnon. I have helped many, many people exit from various cults. (laughs) Diane says the demand for her services has exploded over the last 12 months, basically since the 2020 election. After the insurrection, especially, I started being asked to go on to media events, and that's when they started coming by the hundreds. A huge portion of the country has bought into conspiracy theories and are radicalized in exactly the same way as I was. Diane's come to think of psychological manipulation as a public health issue, like an epidemic. She says there aren't nearly enough deprogrammers to address the scale of mind control that's happening in America right now, thanks to QAnon. So her organization, Antidote, recently started teaching the people who come to them how to deprogram their loved ones themselves. It's mole whacking to just help one person at a time, especially right now when the house is on fire. On today's episode, we're going to talk about cults. Specifically, we're going to talk about the cult of QAnon and the relationship between propaganda and mind control. Here's what I want to know. How exactly does QAnon work? Why has it captivated so many Americans? And what role did it play in the attack on the Capitol on January 6th? I'm Kim Cutter, and this is The Control Variable. Episode four, True Believers. have actually been around forever. There were death cults in prehistoric Malta, bull cults in ancient Egypt, and of course the ancient Greeks had cults devoted to gods like Dionysus and Aphrodite. Cults tended to flourish in times of uncertainty, and there were often animal or even human sacrifices involved. But while a lot of these early cults focused on worshiping a specific deity, most modern cults revolve around a specific human. 
today, all the children of Jonestown are having a fun day parade and showing their happiness and how, how well they love it here in Jonestown. It's just miracle like that after miracle. It's just tremendous what the power of Father's socialism can do for all. Jonestown was supposed to be a paradise in the South American jungle. It was anything but. A cult typically has what's regarded as a charismatic leader who is usually a narcissist and almost always authoritarian. That's sociologist, cult expert, and cult survivor, Yanya Lalich. The leader actually could be alive or dead. And that person has offered some kind of solution to something. So it could be religious, political, new agey, you know, therapy. It could be anything. It could be any kind of ideology. It doesn't have to do with religion. We all know about the most famous of these cults, the sex cults like Nexium and Children of God, apocalyptic cults like Jonestown and the Manson family and Heaven's Gate, where dozens and sometimes many hundreds of people ended up dead. We'll title this tape, Planet Earth about to be recycled. Your only chance to evacuate is to leave with us. That's from a video Heaven's Gate cult leader Marshall Applewhite made the night before he and his 38 followers died by suicide in 1997. They believed a UFO was on its way to pick them up and transport them to a heavenly dimension that they called the next level. QAnon has a lot in common with cults like Heaven's Gate and Nexium but it's also got some important differences. For starters, it doesn't have a charismatic figurehead like Apple White or Keith Raniere at its helm. Its leader, Q, is anonymous. No one's really sure who Q is. And at this point, it seems likely that Q is more than one person. The Atlantic's Adrienne LaFrance has spent months studying QAnon and its shadowy origins. This mysterious figure, Q, is someone with military intelligence who's secretly working with Donald Trump to take down high-profile Democrats. The other important difference is that QAnon exists almost entirely online, in the ether. QAnon, once a fringe phenomenon, is now exploding online, supercharged by the power of social media. There's no isolated compound where Q members live and work together. No QAnon version of the Spawn Ranch or Jonestown. And while this lack of brick and mortar presence might at first seem like a drawback, like where do you recruit people? How do you maintain control over them? Yanya Lalich says it's actually what's allowed QAnon to spread so rapidly. So it's a little different for someone like me who always, you know, now I call them the run of the mill cults, right? They were like, they had a physical presence. There was a headquarters. You usually knew where it was. You knew who the leader was. You knew where the various centers were. And also what we have now, which is, which really has never happened before, is it's on a national scale. Uh, right. So that, that makes it even a, a bit more concerning. It's also kind of amazing when you consider how QAnon got started, which was basically as a side comment on the notorious message board 4chan back in the fall of 2017. In those days, the poll board on 4chan had a really specific vibe. Poll, by the way, stands for politically incorrect. It was the kind of place where people basically went to make up the craziest stuff they could think of, often just for the hell of it. So QAnon was the latest in a long line of what are called Anons, these uh, secret truth tellers who go onto places like 4chan and play these characters. That's conspiracy writer Mike Rothschild. Mike wrote a book about Q. He says the original Anons were kind of like internet cosplayers. So before QAnon, you had FBI Anon, you had White House Insider Anon, you, you had a, there was an MI5 Anon for British intelligence. There was a guy who called himself Highway Patrolman who claimed to be on the border of the U.S. and Mexico intercepting shipments of trafficked children. These stories were never presented with anything like proof. They were basically just showing up, answering questions in character, and then they would disappear. Then, on October 28th of 2017, came QAnon, a supposed top-secret government operative with, quote, Q-level clearance. Q's first post on 4chan isn't even really a post. It's just a response to another conspiracy theorist who claims Hillary Clinton is going to be arrested in a few days. 
the character that we now know as Q chimes in with Hillary Clinton's passport has been flagged. She is already extradition already in motion. You will know when the National Guard and Marines are called up, ask them who they are reporting to. The exact post reads, HRC extradition already in motion, effective yesterday, with several countries in case of cross-border run. Passport approved to be flagged, effective 10.30 at 12.01 a.m. That was the beginning. In retrospect, it's kind of amazing how quickly Q caught on. Mike says within 10 to 15 posts, conspiracy theorists were already gathering around Q, like kids at a campfire. Within a month, two 4chan moderators and an alt-right YouTuber named Tracy Diaz had decided that Q was meant for bigger things. They wanted to take it mainstream. They started a Reddit community called Great Awakening, and Diaz started posting videos about QAnon on YouTube. They'd eventually rack up 8 million views. And it's worth noting that a Reuters report claims Russian-backed Twitter accounts had already started promoting QAnon in November of 2017. So basically, as soon as Q started posting. And as the uh, first couple of weeks of these Q drops on 4chan go, there is a secret war between good and evil. The good side is about to make its final move. Trump will unleash a storm of mass arrests. You will know about it when the emergency alert system is activated. Uh, Troops are called up and are patrolling the streets. Everything will be okay. You just have to have faith. All of this is going to happen in about two weeks. A few weeks pass. Q's promised storm still hasn't materialized. Mike says. Q then changes their story to say that everything that I've been talking about was not actually what I was talking about. It was about a purge in Saudi Arabia. At first, Mike assumes that's the end of Q. It was just a joke, another whacked out internet fantasy, like Pizzagate or Frazzledrip, both of which, it's worth noting, have now been incorporated into the vast conspiracy turducken that is QAnon. But oddly, all these delays in the storm's arrival have the opposite effect. More people just keep gathering around the campfire. One of the things that Q actually did quite brilliantly early on was to say disinformation is necessary. So what that means is sometimes I will lie to you, which uh, is about the most culty thing you can really do to somebody. Like, sometimes I'm going to lie to you and it's for your own good. When Q announces that their account on 4chan has been hacked, people follow them over to an even more unregulated board called 8chan, later 8con. And the party keeps growing from there. Mike says this is partly because QAnon keeps readers busy running down all kinds of other conspiracy rabbit holes and partly because they just really want to believe. By that point, the people who have locked into this story really want it to be true. And when you have a story that is very compelling and you want it to be true, you will not walk away from it because then you're not going to get what you want. So you go deeper and deeper into this rabbit hole rather than admit to yourself that this was never going to happen in the first place. Q most certainly did send me, ladies and gentlemen. Q is the highest levels of the military and the intelligence community in the United States. And they are disseminating above top secret information to patriots in our republic. That means people like you. So that we can take back our country from the communists and the globalists who have infiltrated our government at some of the highest levels and some of the lowest levels, like pollsters, so that they can bring us down from the inside, ladies and gentlemen, because they knew. That's QAnon shaman Jacob Chansley. According to Rothschild, what makes the QAnon story so popular is how, like, Star Wars level simple and compelling it is. It's the story of a war between pure good versus pure evil. Here is the point. The world is currently experiencing a dramatic covert war of biblical proportions. Literally the fight for Earth between the forces of good and evil. A fascinating, suspenseful, immersive mystery with a prophecy and endless Easter eggs. Like a video game, but better because it's about the real world and about the fate of America. And yet, it's so much more exciting than the real America, because you have a role. Q has been a fun distraction for those who follow world events and desire truth. But it is about to begin a much more important and necessary phase, keeping the public informed when the deep state war breaks out onto the surface. Q encourages you to do the research, follow the breadcrumbs, help bring the demons to light, save the children. And I have to say, the way Q tells the story is brilliant. Delivering nuggets of so-called top-secret information in cryptic posts called Q-drops, full of insidery-sounding jargon and ominous cliffhangers. 
The most devoted Anons, known as bakers, then research the drops, aka breadcrumbs, and present their findings in tweets, videos, and or posts that anyone can understand. All are welcome. Q encourages everyone to do their due diligence, take the red pill, find the truth. Fellow slaves, it's time to buckle your seatbelt, recognize your true enemy, and embrace a new future that we all owe to the brave patriots who risk their lives to achieve this victory against the greatest force of evil the world has ever known. May God bless of course, the real truth is that each nugget of Q's misinformation just leads you further into this massive web of BS. And what's amazing about this web is that once you're inside it, it creates what deprogrammers call a closed loop or echo chamber around you. Basically seals you up inside this big soundproof bubble without you realizing it. So while you feel like you're discovering this whole incredible conspiracy, you're really just stuck inside a nest of lies. And in this nest of lies, America has been overrun by the worst kind of evil. A cabal of deranged liberal politicians and Hollywood elites are raping and torturing children to harvest a chemical compound from their blood called adrenochrome, which they believe is a kind of magical youth serum. This is what Q calls the deep state. And heroic, long-suffering Donald Trump is waging a secret war to bring them all down. Get the evildoers arrested and publicly executed, restore justice, peace, and the American way. We are Q. Some of those people wearing and holding the 17th letter of the alphabet. Are you holding a big red, white, and blue Q? Why do you have that? It's a movement, man. It's the shift. I can feel it coming. When I asked Mike about the people who follow Q, he says this. Overwhelmingly, the demographic that they have in common is that they already believe conspiracy theories are real. Q was just a, a rung up the ladder of conspiracies that you were already into. So you were already a 9-11 truther. You were already a, uh, an Obama birth certificate truther. The issue under the United States Constitution is whether the president is eligible to hold the office. You had your eyes uh, opened by Donald Trump winning the presidency and declaring he was going to get rid of all these people in the swamp. And we are going to end the government of corruption. We're going to drain the swamp in Washington, D.C. You were already a JFK truther, a moon landing truther. All of these things that seem like they are a little bit siloed all come together in Q. So if you believe any of those things, Q has something for you, and you can buy into that element of Q that you think is real. But by 2020, Q's promised storm still hasn't materialized. There are no mass arrests, no public executions. Q starts talking about something new. And it's not the pandemic. What Q is doing is, is laying out a story that the election is going to be stolen. This is going to be a fraud like you've never seen. Count the legal votes, I easily win. If you count the illegal votes, they can try to steal the election from us. This is a fraud on the American public. This is an embarrassment to our country. We were getting ready to win this election. Frankly, we did win this election. The only way Trump can lose the election is if the election is fraudulent. You know, Trump is this robust, vital, all-knowing, all-powerful God King, and he can only lose if the deep state steals him. Then he lost. Joe Biden will be inaugurated on January 20th. To say this constitutes living in reality. And if I offered you a false reality, if I told you that there was an excellent, phenomenal chance that the Supreme Court was going to step in and deliver a victory to President Trump, I'd be lying to you. So when you have this, this election that goes wrong, people are looking for reasons why it happened. Well, the Q people already know why it happened. Trump claims the results will be overturned. The fraud will be proven. He throws out all these bogus theories about how it happened. Rigged voting machines, fraudulent mail-in ballots. He files lawsuits and claims the Supreme Court is going to declare him president. So not all of those things fail disastrously. These, these lawsuits are a joke. They go nowhere. There's never a possibility that the Supreme Court is going to step in. So finally, what you start to see is desperation. 
And in December, what you start seeing is the idea that Mike Pence is like the final arbiter of who will be the president. All of these lawsuits, all of these audits, they were never designed to win. They weren't supposed to win. What they were supposed to do is build up a body of proof for Mike Pence to discard the election result and declare Trump the winner. So the last line of defense is Mike Pence. And when it becomes clear that Pence actually is going to swear Biden in as president on January 6th, there's only one thing left that can save America. For Q's people, the time has finally come. On January 5th, Ashley Babbitt, who would be shot and killed by a Capitol Police officer while trying to climb through a broken window at the Capitol building the next day, tweeted, nothing will stop us. They can try and try and try, but the storm is here. It's been a year now since the insurrection. According to a May 2021 survey by the Public Religion Research Institute, 15% of Americans believe the core Q tenet that Donald Trump is fighting a secret battle against a cabal of liberal, Satan-worshipping pedophiles. That's roughly 50 million people. And according to that same study, 20% of Americans believe that there is a storm coming soon that will sweep away the elites in power and restore the rightful leaders. That's almost 69 million people. How did this happen? Why do so many people believe a story that sounds like it was ripped from the front page of the National Enquirer? When I first started working on the control variable, I interviewed an English medieval scholar about propaganda in the Middle Ages. We mostly talked about the Reformation, Martin Luther, the printing press. But at the end of our interview, he said, you know, you should find someone who can tell you about the First Crusade. That's what your trouble in America really reminds me of. I was curious about this. So I tracked down a historian at USC named Jay Rubenstein. Rubenstein's kind of a superhero in his field. He won a MacArthur Genius Grant for his writing about the First Crusade. They named a street after him in his hometown in Oklahoma. And as I talked to Rubenstein, I start to realize that Q's story about blood drinking pedophiles isn't very original at all. It's really just a variation of a story that's been around for thousands of years. I, I'm always reluctant to draw too close parallels between the Middle Ages and today. But I will say when I, I got interested in Q, a friend of mine said, you might want to look into this. So I, I started reading the QAnon stuff and it was pretty shocking how close to the medieval playbook yeah. their ideas are. Yeah. The, the anti-Semitism, the children in danger, one of the, the really destructive myths about the Jews is that every year they're sacrificing a Christian child. The fact that you guys are attacking us and making us look like we're crazy when we're just trying to save some f***ing children pisses me off. Well, what we're saying is crazy is the Satanists who are hurting children, not the people who are trying to expose it and save us. That myth is what's known as a blood libel. And it's important to note here that there's never been any evidence of a blood libel actually taking place. Rubenstein brings up a rally called the Council of Clermont. It took place almost a thousand years ago in France. Basically, Pope Urban II called upon the people of France to go on a crusade against Muslims in the Holy Land. Jerusalem was under Islamic rule at the time. And to rile people up, Urban told a story that the Muslims there were committing unspeakable atrocities against Christians. He claimed the evildoers were torturing and murdering people, bathing in their blood, raping Christian women and children. Sound familiar? He would say to start out, they charge incredible tolls. You have to pay a lot of money to get into Jerusalem. It isn't that awful. But if you can't pay, then they will cut open your bodies to see if you've swallowed coins. Or if they really want to have fun, they will, I, I suspect this is not anatomically possible, but they will um, sort of hook into your belly button um, attach a rope to it, attach the other end of the rope to a pole and make you run around it until your innards start to spill out and come out all over the ground. He put a lot of creative thought into the tortures. Um, was any of it true? Almost certainly not. Truth wasn't the point. This was wartime propaganda. A powerful leader telling people a story that was sure to outrage them. A clear-cut case of good versus evil. Us 
versus them. Things were bad in France in a way that sounds eerily similar to America in 2020. The country was overrun with disease and natural disasters. A lot of people thought they were living in the end times. So when Urban announced that it was time to go liberate Jerusalem from the demons that were torturing innocent Christians, people went wild. Rubenstein says a lot of them thought the day of judgment had arrived. The apocalypse was now. It was time to go fight for God in the final battle. The crowd began, according to the eyewitnesses, spontaneously to proclaim, Deus volt, God wills it. These words are really important because people are literally using the phrase, God wills it, as a way to inflame the crowd and turn them violent. I am certain that he had people scattered in the crowd to start saying Deus volt to get people worked up. There's no doubt it was a great propaganda coup. The response to Urban's speech was insane. An army of 100,000 men rose up and prepared to go to battle. And just a few weeks later, a faction of those men, mostly peasants, set out for Jerusalem on what would become known as the People's Crusade. Along the way, they killed several thousand Jews along the Rhine River in what's known as the Rhineland Massacre. In recent years, Deus Volt has become a big rallying cry for the alt-right. Nowadays, it refers to the idea of a racially motivated defense of the Christian West against what the alt-right sees as an invasion of brown foreigners. Hashtag Deus Vault and Deus Vault memes were hugely popular among Trump supporters in the 2016 election. Video games like Crusader Kings had reintroduced Crusader imagery to popular culture, and white supremacists were all over it. At the Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville in 2017, Crusader imagery was everywhere. White supremacists carried white crusader-style shields with red crosses and the words Deus Volt emblazoned across the front. Amidst the shouts of Jews will not replace us, rioters chanted, Deus Volt. My first introduction to how widespread this was becoming is when I was still in Tennessee and I, I went to a, an outdoor Greek fair and I saw a young couple with a baby carriage and the baby carriage had Deus Volt on it. But it was... The idea was like a motto. We're like, just probably saying, I'm raising the baby to be part of God's army. But sure. the, the I say anti-Semitism, anti-Islam, these are, these are similar impulses that, that lie behind the, the attack on the Capitol and um, the, the crusade movement. I think it would probably take about 20 seconds of going through photographs to find actual crusader imagery being used by the insurrectionists. There were Deus Vault flags flying at the attack on the Capitol on January 6th. A man in a Crusader-style white T-shirt with a big red cross in the front charged up the Capitol steps. They will be met with fire and fury like the world has never seen. So Biden was sworn into office. Q stopped posting. Former 8chan administrator Ron Watkins, whom a lot of people think may actually be Q, posted on Telegram advising Q's followers. We gave it our all. Now we need to keep our chins up and go back to our lives as best we are able. A lot of people thought QAnon would fade away after that. But the experts I spoke with say QAnon is actually growing and changing. They say without Q at the helm, it's kind of a headless monster. Which means at this point, Q is basically being steered by the emotions of the crowd itself. So for a long time, Q was very right wing, very pro Trump. Uh, you know, liberals didn't want anything to do with it. But then with the pandemic, you started to see those traditionally more progressive conspiracy areas the wellness conspiracies, the big pharma conspiracies, the anti vax stuff, a lot of anti technology stuff. Those things started to merge with QAnon because people were locked inside. They lost their jobs. They were working from home. They've been cut off from their social circles. And they were angry. In Q's absence, various would-be leaders and splinter groups sprang up. Although no one's been able to take Q's mantle, the headless monster raged on, lashing out first against the vaccine, then against critical race theory, and picking up surprising new factions along the way. And they were looking for somebody to blame for what's going on. So you, you go online, you start looking for enemies to fight. And at the same time, the people who really don't like Trump who were a lot of them were Bernie Sanders backers, were going, okay, what is the pharmaceutical industry doing to us? What is Bill Gates doing to us? What is the 5G people doing to us? They joined Facebook groups about that. 
And so the Facebook algorithm said, oh, you like uh, an anti-5G group? Well, maybe you'd like to join this anti-vaccine Facebook group. On November 1st, a fringe conspiracy theorist named Michael Protzman led hundreds of Cuba believers to Dallas, promising the resurrection of JFK and JFK Jr. As I write this, dozens of those people are still in Dallas with Protzman, reportedly drinking from a communal bowl of chlorine dioxide bleach as they wait for the return of Camelot. So all of these different worlds merged together in the pandemic and formed basically just a giant octopus of conspiracy and a giant octopus of special knowledge of feeling like the rules don't apply to you, that you know better, you know better than Fauci, you know better than these government bureaucrats who want to shove an untested vaccine in your arm and make you wear a slave muzzle. All of it is, I know better than the experts. I am my own expert for my own truth. At what point in your life did you stop listening to the mainstream narrative? When I realized that doing my own research brought me more information than listening to the news ever could. Hmm. Do you believe there's a ring of high profile politicians who are kidnapping and sacrificing children? I do believe that. We don't sit behind a TV to see what's going on with the media lying to us every minute. We need to go out and find out. What will QAnon become next? Will it break up? Will Q resurface? Or will QAnon keep growing and morphing on its own? A headless monster, driven not so much by a hive mind as by a hive gut. And of course, making up this hive are millions of people who've been manipulated into believing in a nefarious, self-perpetuating, propagandistic cult. How do you help these people? Tarzan Calrissian's an email copywriter and former anti-vaxxer who lives in Ontario. She spent most of her life in the New Age community. She eats only organic food. She's really into yoga and meditation, wellness stuff. I sort of already had my mind made up because the community that I belong to was like, we don't vaccinate. Tarzan fell down the QAnon rabbit hole during the pandemic, mostly thanks to Facebook and Instagram. I was watching in my news feed, like I would see things about COVID not being real, that it was like a creation and that it wasn't really as bad as it looks and that masks are damaging and restrict oxygen. And like, I just, that was like all my news feed was just all this alternative stuff. Um, All of these opinions, all these conspiracy theories. I had no idea that they actually belonged to like a subsect of people called that would identify as QAnon. Facebook's algorithm just sent Tarzan links to what it deemed to be related accounts, and she was off to the races. Some accounts, you know, of say the disinformation dozen, or even stuff that I would see other people sharing who had similar beliefs, and then I would follow the trail sure. and follow these accounts that were like really alternative. And then often would link to websites that like I never had heard of and would never remember. Like I wasn't reading the New York Times. I wasn't reading the Washington Post. Tarzan says as she explored the links that led her into QAnon's conspiracy theory, she felt like she was figuring out something really important, something the rest of the world didn't know. I think where there was the most appeal for me is I see myself as someone who is a free thinker and someone who questions Mm -hmm. someone who's like really an individual with my own beliefs. And this to me felt like I was exercising my freedom to believe something different. But at a certain point, the idea of getting vaccinated stopped sounding so crazy to her. The argument that I often hear in the wellness world is like, I am healthy. I am eating organic food. I am taking care of myself a very individualist perspective on it. And I was just looking a little bit broader and seeing like, well, I don't represent the whole world. People can die. Yes. So. (laughs) These days, Tarzan's not sure what she believes. Her decision to get vaccinated cost her most of her friends, her identity, basically her whole relationship with the new age community. When someone leaves a cult of any kind or any kind of an extremist group, one of the hardest things is, who am I now? 
That's cult deprogrammer Diane Ben Scoder again. She's working around the clock these days to meet the demand for her services, thanks to QAnon. We're creating ways to scale our, our direct services as an organization to rise to the occasion of the thousands of people who need help. So we're creating educational videos, psychological manipulation 101, and a series of tools that people can use to be more effective as they communicate with their loved ones. Goal being that eventually, maybe the person will agree to go into family therapy or to talk to someone about the possibility that they've been lied to. Diane says what's equally crucial these days is prevention. The masses have to get to that point, just like learning that tobacco is bad for your health, you know, that causes cancer. And that means curriculum for students at all levels to help them understand how to be more resilient, because there'll always be people who are addicted to power and who want to take advantage of people on a psychological level to either weaponize them, politicize them, divide them, and to control their decisions. If you don't fight like hell, you're not going to have a country anymore. For those of us who know and care about someone who's fallen prey to QAnon, Diane says there's one thing to remember above everything else. If you really want to accomplish anything, you have to start with authentic empathy. She says you have to want to understand why QAnon appealed to these people. What it gave them that they couldn't find anywhere else. Well, like with any group, it's a process of peeling back the onion and the process of helping them understand that they've been taken advantage of. Okay. And once they realize that and they understand more about how psychological manipulation works, and then they can have some dignity about it, that this could happen to anyone, it wasn't because I was stupid, then they can start healing their relationships with their family members that have oftentimes been harmed. So often family therapy is a really good place to refer someone to mm-hmm. so that they can begin to rebuild broken relationships. Of course, there are some relationships that can't be rebuilt. Here's Tarzan again. You know, it's like leaving a religion. Like, it's hard for a relationship to continue to function when someone is changing their religion. Tarzan decided to get the vaccine and get out of QAnon. She told her husband. We have never, in our seven, eight years of being together, like, we never, we're not the type to yell at each other or have explosive fights we had explosive yelling matches. He just felt that he should be consulted on this decision. He was very concerned that I could die. He felt that it was not fair for me to make a decision myself, even though it's my body, which I reminded him again and again, but he felt that because I could die, it is a decision that we should make as a family. Tarzan's now fully vaccinated, but it came at a huge cost. Um, We're getting divorced. So it didn't really end well. America often seems like it's on the verge of divorce too these days. With progressives and conservatives so polarized, it can be hard to imagine how we'll keep the country together. But oddly, when I think about the people who attacked the Capitol, What I see isn't a unified group at all. It's more like what Mike Rothschild says, a kind of octopus. With all these different tentacles of belief that Donald Trump found a way to pull together on that bitterly cold day in Washington, last January 6th. So that's what we're gonna talk about on our fifth and final episode of The Control Variable this season, the Trumpian octopus. We're gonna look at how it came together on January 6th, We'll examine how Trump's masterful combination of propaganda and social media drew supporters from all over the country to Washington, D.C., and incited them to lay siege to the Capitol. And we'll talk about one way that we might keep it from happening again. Thanks for joining me today on The Control Variable. See you next time.
The Control Variable is brought to you by Atomic Whale Studios and executive produced by Jonathan Wilson. The podcast was created by Jonathan, Brian Blatstein, and me. Brian Blatstein and Robert Okendo produced the podcast. Lead sound direction and design by Eric Tortora Patu. Sound editing and design by Liz Maney and Eli Bronstein. With additional editing and design by Spencer Crosby. Fact checking and research by Pamela Vu. And script editing by Samantha Story and Till Osterland. Additional research for the show was provided by Dana Lane and Reagan Eckley. Jessica Kleepak is the creative supervisor, with graphic and website design supported by Emma Waters and Jennifer Von Blanc. Original music was composed and performed by Dan White. The control variable is managed by Sean Madison. Finally, I'm your writer and host, Kim Cutter. A very special thanks to everyone who made our show possible.